The ruin of Beau Repair is located north of the village of Bear Park and immediately southeast of the village of Witten Gilbert, some three miles to the northwest of the city of Durham. The medieval estate of Beau Repair was a manor house created by the Priory and Convent of Durham in 1258 on the orders of Prior Bertram de Middleton. Beau Repair derives from the French, meaning beautiful retreat, and indeed, the outlook from the ruin is beautiful as it is set on a rise overlooking the Brownie Valley. It is said that Beau Repair was Prior Bertram's favourite country retreat, and between 1296 and 1335 it was visited by Kings Edward I, Edward II and Edward III. On the 7th of October 1346, King David II of Scotland invaded England with a Scots army of approximately 12,000 men. He was expecting to find Northern England relatively undefended because Edward III was at the time absent while conducting a major campaign in France. After taking Liddersdale and sacking the Priory of Hexham and then burning the territory around their line of march, the Scots moved on towards their ultimate goal of Durham and Yorkshire. However, the English had prepared for an invasion by the Scots and a small army was quickly mobilised in Richmond under the supervision of William Zouch, the Archbishop of York, and soon they began marching for Durham. The Scots arrived at Durham on the 16th of October and camped at Bow Repair, where the Scots were offered a thousand pounds in protection money, which was to be paid on the 18th. On the morning of the 17th of October, while the main force was still encamped at Bow Repair, Around 500 troops under the command of William Douglas stumbled upon the advancing English in the morning mist while raiding a few miles south of Durham, somewhere in the area of Kirk Merrington. The two rearward divisions of the English army drove the Scots off with heavy Scottish casualties. Douglas then raced back to David II's camp to tell the news of the English advance. It is also at this time that two monks arrived from Durham in an attempt to broker peace, but David II, thinking they were spies and false priests, ordered their beheading. However, they escaped during the ensuing chaos. King David led his army to high ground at Neville's Cross, just to the west of Durham, where he prepared his army in three battalions and waited for the English attack. The battle was a disaster for the Scots, and King David was captured after he fled the field while the rest of the Scottish army was pursued and cut down by the English as they fled back up the Brownie Valley. During the Scots' stay at Beau Repair, the manor had been completely pillaged and ruined, leaving only the shattered and roofless shell of the chapel, with dilapidated remains of some adjacent buildings. However, the building was restored and extended again by Prior Fossa in the late 1300s to an E-plan mansion with adjacent gardens courtyards and buildings, and it was developed into a rest home for the monks of Durham Cathedral. It was said it could house up to 40 monks at any one time. Even so, the priors continued to use it as a favoured country residence until the dissolution. An inventory of 1464 describes the buildings as containing a chapel, outer and inner chambers, hall, buttery and kitchen. After the dissolution, the buildings at Bow Repair became the property of the Dean of Durham, but their subsequent use is not clear. In the 1640s, during the English Civil War, the Scots Covenanter army inflicted great damage on the site twice, once in 1640 and again in 1644. It is unlikely that the building was ever used after this. By 1787 it lay in ruins, although with walls still standing to roof height. Today, all that survives are some low, ruined walls and a number of grass-covered mounds, unlike so many of our relics from the past, is now beginning to suffer from the attention of vandals.
Mark Newman and I visited the remains of Bow Repair on the 4th of June 2013. I was unaware of any hauntings alleged to be occurring there, but it seemed, considering its history, worth a visit to see for ourselves. After setting down the bags with equipment and coffee in, we immediately started receiving information from spirit contacts there, which was unusual for it is usual practice to take time to acclimatise to the vibrations of the place. While sitting on a low wall in front of a former flight of stairs, Mark made contact with a man at arms wearing a breastplate, a round topped helmet, possibly a salad, a tunic that flared into a skirt at the base, yellow hose on his legs and flimsy looking shoes on his feet. He was seen carrying a halberd or pike and was, according to Mark, apparently guarding the place. Mark also mentioned that at one point during the contact he was holding the weapon in both hands and making chopping motions towards me. This contact did not give any names or details. While still at this location, but seen walking in what may have been the hall behind our seating position, I was made aware of a monk who was pacing about. He was dressed in a plain white habit with a brown wooden cross hanging from the belt. He was tonsured and again, when seen, was reading from a book held open in both hands as he walked slowly around. He did not give any of names or details and seemed quite oblivious to our presence and slowly just faded away from our contact. And it was also while sitting here that I was jogged out of my floating reverie, seeing which spirits were around, when a female presence made herself known. She was a woman with, shall we say, a very well-developed sense of fun. Giving the name Betty, or Elizabeth, she was a rather attractive woman in her mid to late twenties, with long black hair, at least as far down her back to past the shoulders. I saw her wearing a light blue sleeveless and collarless bodice that was pointed to the waist and laced at the front with blue cord. There were brass points on the ends of the cords to preserve them. Underneath the overdress she wore a white chemise. This had no collar and the neckline was simply stitched, the sleeves of which reached to the elbows but no further. They seemed to be cut open at that point. Giving me the name Elizabeth and also Bess and Beth, she was a rather attractive woman in her mid to late twenties with long black hair at least as far down her back as to pass the shoulders. I saw her wearing a light blue sleeveless and collarless bodice that was pointed to the waist and laced at the front with blue cord. There were brass points on the ends of the cords to preserve them. Underneath this she wore a white chemise. This had no collar and the neckline was simply stitched, the sleeves of which reached to the elbows but no further they seemed to be perhaps cut open at that point. The neckline was a simple low cut circle with a draw cord at the front revealing much of her ample bosom or should that be not concealing much. She wore a mid brown voluminous skirt which was of ankle length where it was noticed that she was barefoot. I estimate from her clothing that she was perhaps of the 16th or early 17th centuries. She was giggling and chuckling unashamed to flirt outrageously and making all sorts of suggestions while showing off her breasts as revealed by the low neckline of her shift in a most provocative manner. What she was doing at the manor I do not know, she wouldn't say. She stayed with me all the time that we were at the ruin, periodically making rude suggestions and at the end, when we departed, she blew me a kiss. At this point we stopped, had a coffee and then started the first of the spirit box sessions, largely, I must say, because of Elizabeth, in the hope that she would speak to us through the box. After the PSB session, we crossed over the wall and into what was a long hall, and Mark made contact with the Puritan, and then I made his acquaintance as well. He was a man of about five foot six in height and gaunt in appearance, clearly a Puritan in a very monochrome costume, with a white collar that overlay the coat at the neck. He was carrying a book in the left hand clutched to his breast, probably a large Bible. He is very much of the period 1630 to 1640. I had the impression that he did not approve of us being there, and he gave the name of Francis. Whether this was a first or a surname, I couldn't say. Giving us a look 
akin to discovering dog muck on one shoe, he departed. After a wander around the ruin and another spirit box session, we returned to the steps and I made contact, if that is the right word, with what I think was a memory. A reverent from a fairly recent period, I felt of between the wars in 1920 or 1930, of about six foot tall, slim of build, and wearing a dark grey suit with a dog collar. He was probably a visitor to the place from a church nearby, and I had again the impression that he had wandered down from nearby Witten Gilbert to find somewhere that offered peace and quiet. The general feeling was that he was practicing reading out his sermon for later use in the church. Our final contact of the day was a young woman, somewhere between 18 and 24, attired in a white floppy hat and a white flowing dress of a style perhaps at the turn of the 20th century. She was just sitting on a fold-up chair with an easel, happily painting, but it must be added that this contact was tenuous and again she paid no attention to us. Our impressions gained while we were there were of a large gold cross radiating light in the area of the stairs and at another point just after the spirit box session there was the clear but psychic hearing of a single bell tolling, a dong sound, repeating for perhaps a minute, and then all was silent apart from the birds and the insects. We conducted three sessions, starting with the spirit box, and then a plain EVP session followed by a final spirit box session. The middle EVP session, when analysed, produced no voices at all. The first spirit box session was conducted with the box set on FM with the reverse sweeps and the rate set to 100 milliseconds. The second spirit box session was conducted with the box set on FM with reverse sweeps and the rate set to 200 milliseconds to see if this improved the communications. We also tried briefly on the AM band but found this gave more radio interference. The replies that are presented here are only those which I consider more identifiable. This is the Spirit Box session at Bow Repair. Is there anybody here? If there is, can you tell me your name? And can you tell me your age? Can you tell me why you're here? Can you tell me your name again? We didn't get it clearly. I know it's difficult. Just come, just come and speak at this little machine for me. It'll pick up your voice. We don't mean you any harm. Please come forwards. Are you the soldier that Mark saw? Are, are you the reverend? If you are, can you tell me your name? Uh. Can you tell me your age? Can you give me the name of one of the saints? Uh. It's trying. Uh. Def I, I know you're trying. I know you're trying. You'll get the hang of this eventually. It takes a little yeah. bit of practice. Can you tell me what the name of the king is? Is there a king? Can you tell me what the situation with the Scots is? Did you know they came and wrecked this place? Can you tell me what this part of the building was used for? Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Do you know who the goal is that I saw? Are you, can you say you're male or female? No. It was that Michael I heard. No. What was it? Are you affected by the sunlight? It's a question I've always wanted to ask. Hmm. Are these silly questions? If you're not, can you bring her in? So that concludes the investigation at Bow Repair. I really must go there again sometime soon and take another session and see if I can reacquaint myself with Elizabeth. If anyone listening has investigated at or had an encounter at Bow Repair, I would love to hear from you.